Good morning, everyone. You may now be seated. It's a joy to see you all. It's a wonderful opportunity again to be together and to be reminded of God's love and His grace upon us. Today, we are in section in Mark chapter 10 as we continue our series in the book of Mark. And this chapter, uh, starting in verse 32 in our text this morning, is Jesus' prediction regarding His death. And in this particular section, we can see a more detailed information regarding what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And now that they're going up in Jerusalem, and Jesus clearly communicates to his disciples that he is indeed going to die. That he is indeed going to give his life as a sacrifice for many. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of people would say that, the death of Jesus Christ is you know, nothing that is planned. It's just accidental. It's just basically uh, his aggressiveness and his zeal led to his death. But we all know that this is something that the Father has planned in eternity past, that Jesus would come to be born in a manger, to die at the cross, so that those who believe in him will have everlasting life. That all throughout the Old Testament, when they're doing all their offerings, all their offerings that they practice every year, every time, looks forward to the perfect sacrifice. And that is none, that is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when John the Baptist was introducing the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And in this particular section, Jesus reminds his disciples about his death. And we can see an important lesson in this particular section, because not only that he's saying, and not only that he's communicating to them that he's going to die, but he's teaching them a, a very important lesson, and that is humility. Humility is something that the world hates. Humility is something the world does not understand. And here Jesus reminds his disciples the importance of humility. And this humility boils from or comes out from a person who truly understands love. It's hard for us to be humble when we don't know how to love. Does that make sense? Because when, when, when we love ourselves, when, when I, myself, and me becomes the center of your life, it's hard for you to be humble. Lucifer's pride destroyed him, right? Why? Because he's so motivated by self-love. At this particular section, verse 32 and 34, my desire as we move on, uh, chapter, 32 to, uh, chapter 10, verse 32 to 45 of Mark, my desire for us this morning is to truly understand the idea of love what is love and what is it all about so that we can respond in humility and be able to live a life that glorifies God and that is centered on none other than Christ. So in verse 32 and 34, we can see here that Jesus paints the picture of his love. And how did Jesus communicate his love? Look with me in verse 32. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them that was about to happen to him. Continue on in verse 33 saying, See, we are all going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And in this particular section, you can see that Jesus paints the picture of love. And what is the picture of love here? That Jesus is saying that I will be delivered, I will die on the cross because I love you. You guys know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever lives in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Here in verse 32, you can see when Jesus painted this love for us, he gave his life for us, and he gave it willingly. How many of you guys would be willing to march to your death? 
if you guys know that you're dying today, would you say, okay, um, there's going to be an accident in the intersection of Prudence and Golf Links, and it's going to be you driving right there, and that's going to be the end of your life. Would you drive and take that intersection? You'll be like, uh-oh, no. <laughs> nope, I'm not going there. But Jesus was willing. If you see the passage here, Jesus was walking, what, ahead of them. He knew that Jerusalem is the place wherein he will be crucified. And at this point, he will be standing in front of the scribes and the Pharisees, all the chief priests. He knew that, that his death is coming. But he was marching willingly ahead of them. While others were afraid. If you see that in the passage, those who followed him were afraid. They were amazed for the boldness of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were amazed that not only that he's willingly coming to Jerusalem, but he's very courageous to move forward knowing that he's going to die. Because Jesus loves us, he courageously faced death. Because he loves us, he courageously face the agony of the cross. Because he loves us, he is willing. He is willing to suffer pain, rejection, betrayal, and all of these things that is involved in his death and crucifixion. He came to his own, and the Bible says what? And his own receive him not. Jesus courageously faced death. He was willing to go to the cross. He walks ahead of everyone. He's not, um, he's not reluctant. He's not fearful. He's not confused. He went and faced what is about to happen to him at the cross. Why? Because he's convinced and he knows that in three days he will rise. That Jesus' death is complete because he will rise from the grave. That he's, his suffering, his sacrifice of the cross is sufficient for one's salvation because he died and rose from the grave. Therefore, we have hope. Therefore, we have hope that Jesus lives and those who are in Christ will live with him. But the sad thing is, if you look at verse 35, Jesus paints a beautiful picture of love and he's saying I love you all I'm gonna die for you I'm willing to give my life to you and I'm marching with courage to face my death so that I could pay your sins that I could be a propitiation for our, for your sins that I could pay the penalty of the world's sin but the sad thing is this that instead of his disciples embracing the idea of love, embracing and saying, Lord, we want to be like that. We want to love you, God. We want to love you, Jesus. If you look at verse 35, what's going on in verse 35? Down to verse 41. It says here, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. I was like, wow, right? Jesus was on his way to his death. Well, this, James and John, all they think about is what? They think about themselves. John and James, they think that Jesus is under their disposal. Why? Because instead of them focusing on loving Christ, instead of them focusing on Christ's love for them, their focus or their self-love. They were so selfish because they, they focus on what they want rather than what Jesus is doing for them. And the, the amazing thing is that they're like kids who would say, um, it's like my kids. They would say, Dad, Dad, just say yes. It's like, Dad, Dad, say yes, say yes. It's like, no, I'm not going to say yes. And this is basically what they're saying. Lord, can you do everything for us? Can you do something for us? Verse 36, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? 
James and John, they're so focused on themselves. They think that Jesus is under their disposal. James and John are focused, instead of developing humility in their hearts, they are so focused with their own selves that they want Jesus to do something for them. A lot of times we people, instead of us focusing on God's love, we are so focused on what God can do for us. Instead of us focusing on loving God, we are so focused on what God can do for us. And even in our prayers, we treat God as like the blue guy. You guys know the blue guy? The genie in the bottle. And when we pray, it's like, Lord, I want you to show up right now. I have three wishes. Like, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. We demand a lot from God, but we, we fail to show our love for Him. So what did they ask of God? What did they ask of the Lord Jesus Christ? Verse 37. And they said to him, Grant us to sit at your right hand and at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? So what did they ask? They're so focused on themselves that when Jesus was talking about his death, they didn't even understand or they didn't even pay attention to what Jesus is saying. All they think about is like, well, what am I going to get from Christ? What, what will I get from this? And so they said, Jesus, can you do something for us? And Jesus is like, what do you want? Ah, we want the glory. We want the position. Can we sit on your left and in your right? And in their ancient custom, kings would take the very important people in his life and have them sit on, their, on his left and on his right. And this is basically John and James is saying, we want the glory. We want the position. And at this point, they're not, they're not thinking about humility. All they think about is themselves. They think that they are worthy of the position and glory. And a lot of times we men, we people, when we come to the Lord, we always say, I think I'm a good person. Lord, I think I deserve this. Have you guys heard people like that? It's like, Lord, give me this because I think I deserve it. You know, I work so hard. I go to church every Sunday. I serve you in church. I give my offering. I deserve it. So Lord, answer my prayers. It's like we're demanding of God. God is saying, that's crazy. A lot of times you are guilty of that because we think the Lord, we think of God as, as under our disposal. Same with John and James. They're like, Lord, have us sit down in your, in your right hand and left. Give us the glory. Give us the position that we desire. We are worthy of that position. We are worthy of your time. And Jesus said to them lovingly, he said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized through the baptism with which I am baptized? Jesus is saying, you ask for glory, the price of glory is sacrifice. Are you able to endure that sacrifice? Funny thing is in verse 39, they said what? Yep. With full confidence, they said, we are able. We are able. You can see the pride in their hearts in here. They come to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, do what we asked of you. And Jesus is like, what do you want? Give us the glory. And Jesus is saying, you want glory? You have to sacrifice. They don't even think about the sacrifice. They think about the glory. And so what's their answer? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. 
Sounds like us, huh? Right? A lot of times we give like crazy answers. Answers that is full of confidence, but empty confidence. Because if we truly search our hearts, if we truly search our love for Christ, our love for Christ is not enough for us to endure the sufferings and the sacrifice that is out there. <clears throat> Drinking the cup and being baptized are references to sufferings and pain. And Jesus is telling them, look, if you're looking to be elevated in the kingdom of God, you need to understand that the principle for glory is to go through sacrifice, to go through pain. Jesus was talking about the cross, and the, all they think about is their comfort. They're ignorant of the basic principle that reward and honor corresponds directly to sacrificial suffering. So funny, because when Jesus was arrested and they're going through trial, what did they do? They all ran away, right? They all ran away. They all forsook him and fled. There's only one guy following from afar, and that's Peter, right? But it, when it was unfolded that he's, part of the disciples, he denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. <coughs> Excuse me. See the attitude of his disciples. If you look at verse 31, if you continue verse 31, uh, 41, and says, and when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Because of their self-love, because they want themselves to be in the center of everything. The rest of the disciples were what? They got mad. There was division amongst them. Why are they mad? Because James and John calls the first dibs. <laughs> they all want the glory. Remember last Sunday, I think a couple of verses down in chapter 10? You know? They said, Lord, we've given everything to you. We've given everything to you. So now in their mindset, they've given everything to the Lord. Now they deserve everything. When there is self-love, when we are so consumed about ourselves, then it causes division amongst the people of God. When you think about your own self, Everyone around you will be uncomfortable. Everyone around you will suffer. You know, there was a time when I was in Europe, uh, back when I visited Europe, and I was going with some of my friends. And we have one buddy, we have one friend that all she thinks about is herself. It's like, I want to ride this, and everyone needs to ride that ride because she wants to ride that ride. It's like, I, want, I don't want to stand in line, and everyone doesn't want to... Don't have to stand in line because she doesn't want to stand in line. And then while we're walking, I was like, man, this is just crazy. You know? She's happy. Every one of us are miserable. So I end up with a coat. And I said, I wrote it down in a, a tissue paper. And the coat says, if you want everyone's life to be miserable, start to think of your own welfare. In other words, if you only think about yourself, everyone around you will be miserable. Right? Let's take, for example, lunch is coming up soon, right? You guys want to go some places, but I just want to get a specific food. And I said, in this potluck, I want only this kind of food. Right? Maybe someone's like, okay, I'll take that. A lot of you guys may have food restrictions, right? And so you're just looking at me, enjoying my food, while the rest of you have the stomach that's grumbling because you can't take that food. This is basically what John and James is doing. They all, they just thought about their own welfare. They miss, they miss the whole picture that Jesus Christ is trying to paint for them. 
And so Jesus Christ went back. And he paints the picture of how we should love. Matthew 10, 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord over it, over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be among you. Jesus is saying, for you to understand love, if you truly love a person, then you don't lord over one another. What does that mean? You know, kids would always say, you're so boss bossy. Right? What does that mean? You just tell people what to do. Like, do this. Do that. Water, please. Uh, no, no, please. Water. Right? You know, having kids sometimes, <laughs> I would, I would tell my kids, are you guys my boss? Because they were sitting right there in the counter. We have uh, five, five uh, uh, counters. Uh, five, one counter, five chairs, right? Bar stools. And I'm preparing their food or doing some stuff. And then one of my kids say, water, rice, food, or whatever. I was like, really, you guys? And a lot of times we're like that before God. Not only before God, but before one another. We boss people around. We tell them, say, hey, do this. Hey, do that. The Bible is saying, if we truly love one another, we don't boss people around. We don't lord over people. And that's basically a reminder that, that Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder in the witness of suffering of Christ, as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercise oversight, not an, under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering or not lording over the flock, not do, domineering over those in, char, in your charge, but being an example to the flock. Now here Peter is reminding the elders or the pastors like, hey, don't boss over your people. so crazy because there are pastors who is boss and lord over their people you know in the philippines i observed like uh, so one time i was vacuuming this church like i was a youth pastor i was like helping and vacuuming and one of the members came up to me and said pastor you can't vacuum because pastors are not supposed to work <laughs> i'm like what church do you guys go to <laughs> And, and, and it's crazy that there are, there are pastors who would, who would elevate themselves. And some tell evangelists would even say, that's like, hey, I need an air, a jet plane. I need an airplane because I can't fly with sinners. It's like crazy. They, have, they would tell their people crazy stuff. And the Bible reminds us, reminds the elders not to lord over the people. And not only the elders, but each and every one of us, we, have, we are reminded to practice humility. Because if we truly love one another, then we will learn to be humble. And Jesus now makes it clear for each and every one of us in verse 43. He says, but it shall not be among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whomever would be first among you must be slave of all. Now Jesus really clarifies the issue here. He said, you, you, you must be a servant. And then he says in verse 44, you must be a slave. Now a servant is something that's getting paid in their context. A slave is like, nope, nothing. And Jesus reminds us that greatness is not measured by how many people serve you, but it is measured of how many people you serve. Let me say that again. Greatness is measured not by how many people you serve, but how... Okay. Greatness is measured not by how many people serves you, but by how many people you serve. You know, growing up in the Philippines, it's so common 
to see servants help ser serving rich people. You know, if you go in the mall, you can even see uh, women following rich kids, you know, wiping their sweat and everything. It's crazy. And they parade with pride, showing everyone that, hey, I can afford nannies following us around. They're done with their shopping. They come out of the mall. They clap their hands. Car would come. They have a driver. Open their door. They get in. It's like crazy. And there's a lot of cases in the Philippines wherein nannies or maids are, are, were abused by their their, their, their so-called masters. And sometimes you feel like, man, I want to have that, right? How many of you guys want to have someone serving you, right? Someone folding your clothes, doing your laundry, doing your food. You can just sit down there it's like, food, please. Sometimes I feel like, you know, my kids are clapping their hands for me to come. <laughs> Dad, yes, God reminds us, Jesus reminds us that if you want to be great, you, you need to be the servant of all. That God's way for greatness is for us to learn to be humble. And the greatest service and the greatest act of humility was displayed by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. That's why here in verse 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. What else can you not give if you have given your life already? Right? What else can you not give? You know, my dad would always say, the greatest possession one can have is what? His life. So if you have given your life to God, if you're given your life to Him, what else can you not give? Philippians chapter 2. Let me just read verse 1 down to verse 11. It says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the, of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, I'm reading from King James, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being one, of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and had given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That here we are reminded to have the mind of Christ, have the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is that mindset? Mindset of humility. Mindset of humbleness that is rooted in His love. That when we truly love one another, we will learn to be humble and give ourselves to them. Let this mind be in you. Let us have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we need to understand that the path of glory in the kingdom of Christ is none other than humility and love. So as we think about this, 
couple of things that I want to remind you. One, we need to truly learn how to love. We need to learn to love one another. Love is the starting point. If you don't love one another, you're just going to think about yourself. And the world is so remote from the love that the scripture is saying. <clears throat> the world is so far from what the love that God is teaching us. You guys know that song? Learning to love yourself. It's what? The greatest love of all. Wrong. Wrong. Like seriously wrong. Right? A lot of people are doing things because they love themselves. And the Bible is saying no. We need first to love God above everything else and love one another. Jesus says, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And what? The second is like unto it. Love yourself more than anyone else. No. He said what? <clears throat> love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus is saying, you already love yourself. You need to love your neighbor. We need to truly learn how to love. Another song that the world would sing that is so apart from the principles of God. It says, loving you is what? Easy cause you're what? Oh my goodness, right? Jesus loved us despite of our sins. For while we were yet sinners, what's this? Christ died for us. He didn't say, man, this creation is so, so beautiful. I'm going to give my life to them. They're so beautiful. Uh-uh. The Bible says what? That we are filthy rags before God. The Bible says, for all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? There's nothing beautiful that we can offer to God that God would say, loving you is easy because you're beautiful. No. We need to learn to love one another the way Christ loved us. Number two, when we truly love one another, then it's easy to be humble. Right? It's easy to be humble. When you guys have arguments at home, right, and you love the person, it's okay to say, I'm sorry. When there's pride in our hearts, uh-uh, no way. You beg me. When you truly learn to love, then it's easy for you to respond in humility. Why? What is humility? Humility is what? Thinking of others better than yourself. We can remind you to be humble over and over again, but if you don't understand the love of Christ, if you don't understand how the Lord Jesus Christ loved us, then it's hard for you to be humble. And Jesus, is, Jesus painted that picture in front of his disciples. He said, I love you that I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to endure the cross. Why? Because when you understand the love of Christ, you will understand humility, and when you live a life of humility, it's easy for you to give yourself to others. It's easy for you to serve others. Why? Because you understand love, and now you have humility in your heart, then the fruit of that is what? Serving others. You don't sit around and say, uh, coffee. Instead, you go around and ask people, do you guys want coffee?
You don't clap your hands and say, hey, serve me right here. I'm the best guy in this church. I've been here 30, 40 years. Fall in line and serve me. I'm the pastor, serve me. Like, uh uh. If you hear me say that, kick my butt, okay? It's like, get out of here. We need to learn the love of Christ, and therefore we can respond in humility. And when we respond in humility, it's easy for us to serve others sacrificially to the point that, that, that we're giving everything. Why? Because we learned to give our lives already. Right? And lastly, when we understand the love of Christ, then we will respond in humility. When there's humility in our lives, then there's self-sacrifice, self-giving. And when there's self-giving and self-sacrifice in the body of Christ, what comes out of that? Unity. Unity. You know why, why there's a lot of division in churches and in family? Because people would think about themselves more than others. You know, there are churches that split because of the color of the curtain. Some people's like, we want the black curtain. No, we, want, we don't want black curtain. We want white curtain. It's like, okay, you start your church. I'll start my church. They said that's how Baptists multiply, by division. <laughs> it's crazy because they, also, they always think about their preference. And even in church history, you can see that. Churches divide, not because of doctrine, not because of theology. They divide over preference. That's crazy. You yeah? know? Some churches would divide you because you raise your hand too high. You don't raise your hand too high. You just hold the hand. You don't raise your hand. Or, or the song is too fast. Or the song is too slow. It puts me to sleep. You know, churches divide over little things. Why? Because all they think about is their own wants, their preferences. And when people in our family think about what they want, there's always division. There's always division. There's always strife, right? I always think about food around towards the end of my sermon, if you guys notice that, right? In my family, five kids... Right? You hop in the car after church. You ask one question. And the question is, where do you guys want to eat? <laughs> one would say, the little ones would say McDonald's because they want the, you know, the Happy Meal. Right? One would say sushi. One would say Mexican. One would say burger. I was like, Let's just go home and sleep. <laughs> when we think about our wants and desires, then there's division. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand the love of Christ. We need to understand that Jesus Christ gave his all for us. And when we truly understand the love of Christ, it's easy for us to give ourselves to him. When we understand the love of Christ, it's easy for us to serve one another, to live a life of humility, and to honor one another. My desire this morning, as you go home, that we will understand and practice true love. A love that glorifies God. A love that serves one another. A love that upholds one another in peace. And as we continue to live as a church, that there will be unity in our church. Why? Because we will understand that we all are in agreement that we love Christ above every, every, everyone else, everything else. And when we understand that, and when we agree, there's, there will be unity in this church. So let's continue to have the mind of Christ, to give our all for His glory, and to give our lives for one another.
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, dear Father, for your love. We thank you for your grace. God, it is a joy to serve you, to honor you, and to live for you. Help us, dear Father, to do that in every moment of our lives. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.